Hello, Pastor. Hello, David. How are you? Doing good. How are you doing? Oh, I'm pretty good. Yeah. I might, I might have opened up the wrong meeting or something. And Hey, Charlie, how are you? Yeah, it took took me a little while to get on. I I thought uh, I didn't know if I'd done something different, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I might have opened up the wrong meeting code or something. And I was sitting there by myself, and I'm like, "Well, this is unusual. Nobody's here." So yeah, well, so I <laughs> you change you change the uh, the link. Yeah. So I don't know for some reason I hit on it, but still it was having a hard time. I had to try about three times to finally get on. Okay. So I don't know because I don't I don't understand the stuff in the first place, but uh, I'm just glad I made it. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, we'll give everybody a couple minutes. I don't know if it's uh, weather is maybe causing some people trouble getting on tonight or if it's my link that they're going to the old link and uh what what time does that cups game start uh it's raining. It's, <laughs> what uh, time it's raining what's it's raining rain yeah I thought, I thought maybe yeah. they were uh watching the game that could be might be the last game of the year. Man, I tell you. For the Marlins. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully that's the only team that has a bunch of positives, but they played the Phillies yesterday, right? Right. So right. <laughs> we'll see how the Phillies do next week, huh? Yeah. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started and hopefully people will figure out how to join and um, I'll be watching my phone to see if anybody texts me or try to, to get a hold of me. It just may be uh, low attendance tonight. So uh, let me go ahead and pray and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight and uh, being able to look into your word. Uh, Lord, we're just... Uh, Again, thankful for the story that uh, that you've given to us in your in the scripture, and Lord, it brings life. Uh, whether we're studying uh, the history of the Old Testament or uh, the Gospels or the Epistles or the Psalms, Lord, they your word brings us life, and we're thankful for that. So, Lord, I pray that you'd be with us tonight as we look into your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well. Um, I apologize. Last week was just uh, really, really long um, and probably could have split last week up into two different um, uh, weeks. And tonight's is not as long. So we may, may be done a little bit quicker tonight. Um, I can see Joy and Neil hopefully can hear me. They may... Uh, join with their phone too, but I'll just go ahead and keep going as they join in. And just a reminder also that this is recorded and it goes on to the church's YouTube channel. So if you ever miss anything or need to catch up, it'll, it'll be there. Um, I was thinking just because we had covered so much last week and went through so many kings and the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom and how the the uh, land of Israel and Judah had divided up and split up, and we covered so much that sometimes it's easy, I think, to get lost in just all the details of all those many kings and everything, and and maybe lose track of the big picture of what what is this all about? Uh, why are we studying this in the first place? Why are we looking into it other than the fact that it's in Scripture? Um, and I, so I was sitting and kind of thinking about that today. Just, just what is the basic uh, overview of all that we're looking for and why we're looking at this history? And I, I wrote this down and I said, it to, if I could boil it all down into one sentence, it would be that <laughs> God wants to express his love to his children, but it must be done in an environment of purity. So God wants to 
love us, to give us blessings, to enjoy a relationship with us and, and uh, for us to be his children. <clears throat> but it has to be done in an environment of purity and holiness. It can't be done in, uh, in a uh, uh, kind of an environment of sin. So God had to do something about the sin that was introduced there in chapter three of Genesis. Um, and so basically the way he is expressing his love in the Old Testament is through his people, uh, the children of Israel. And the way he expresses his love to us in the New Testament is through his son, Jesus Christ. And I got to thinking as um, he's trying to reveal, God is trying to reveal his love and his basic purpose for us to be his children uh, to the world. And he did it in the Old Testament through his people. But the problem with revealing it through Israel was the fact that, that the people were sinful. So that's why we keep, it seems like Israel keeps running up against this wall. Um, they move a little, you know, two steps forward and three steps back. Um, and we've seen this all the way through from Abraham, where uh, the nation of Israel essentially started with him, all the way up to where we are right now, where um, the land has been taken over by foreign armies. Both the, the north fell to the Assyrians, the south and Judah that we talked about last week fell to the Babylonians, and now they're all in, um, in slavery and been taken out of the land. So um, to me, Israel was kind of uh, a temporary measure of God giving his message until his, the time came for his son, Jesus, to come, the sinless one. And so the perfect expression of God's love to the world and to us is through Jesus. Um, it wasn't a perfect expression through the children of Israel. And so as I, saw, as I, as I uh, thought about why we're studying this is that God is attempting to express his love to the world through Israel, but they're sinful, so they keep falling back, and it's not a perfect expression of his love. So um, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on your reading or just on, on that. Um, we were to read Ezra, uh, the first 10 chapters, and Esther, uh, or actually the whole, the whole book of Ezra and the whole book of Esther. So any, any thoughts from anybody on that this week? I just found it interesting that there was actually um, a remnant of people that remembered the temple and remembered God when they were so into idolatry and everything and so intertwined with other people that there was even people that remembered and wanted to go back to it. <laughs> yeah, that is a, that's a really good point. Um, they had been <clears throat> establishing a new life over in Babylon, even though it wasn't a great life with uh, being, you know, either enslaved or whatever. And we'll kind of talk about that, um, just how the people left the land when uh, the Babylonians took over and then how they came back uh, this week. Um, but that, that's true. Um, <clears throat> God wanted and expected all the Jews to go back. And they didn't all go back, but uh, a large number of them went back. So, um, and they weren't going back to a whole lot because the land had been destroyed and the temple and Jerusalem had been leveled. So they had to start from scratch. That, that, that's a really good point, Mary, that at least some of them wanted to go back the remnant um, and start over. And, and, and we know that uh, as you read it, do you remember uh, as they were dedicating that new temple um, that there was a noise and it, it was, some people were clapping and screaming with joy, but then there was others that were crying. <laughs> and those were the older people because the, the time of captivity was pretty much a short period of time compared to let's say how long they were in Egypt. They were in Egypt for like 400 and some years they were only in captivity in Babylon for around 70 years. So some people who saw the original temple actually made it back to see the new temple. And those were the ones who were weeping because the new temple didn't look anything like the old temple <laughs> it, in, in the grandeur and the size and all that. But um, so some people saw both temples. Any, anybody else? 
Joy and hey, Neil. David. Hey, Pastor. Hey, I, I'm just saying, you know, here in, uh, in Ezra 7, it says, uh, the Lord God of Israel get, had given him, the king granted him all he requested because the hand of the Lord as God was upon him. Uh, verse 9, the, the good hand of his God was upon him. And there, part of the reason in verse 10, it says, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes. And, you know, that's, that's why the hand of the Lord was, was upon him, because it was his, his intent. You know, it says his heart to study, to practice, and to teach. And I, I sometimes think that we think the Lord should, should bless us regardless of uh, where we're at or regardless of our obedience. Uh, but, you know, to me, it just here again reinforces the fact that, that oftentimes the God restricts what he or how he blesses us depending upon where our heart is at and our our purity level or our obedience level so uh, just just to... i think you went mute just for a second okay i'm done okay i'm uh, i'm that's all. okay i think he's having trouble with his connection, but I, that's a yeah. great point. Yeah. Um, Ezra had devoted himself, uh, and he became that great teacher, uh, to the people as he went back to Jerusalem. Um, and it, it wasn't easy for him too, because as he goes back, he recognizes, he knows from scripture and his study that the people should not be intermarrying with the people of the land. And, and he has to deal with that when he gets back. To Jerusalem. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a good point. Devotion to, to studying and observing, not just studying, observing and teaching. And I, I think that does show that we, we do have a responsibility um, as we learn the scripture to find someone to disciple, to teach. Um, once we have it down and we've devoted ourselves to it, to be prepared to reach out to others to teach. So it may just be one-on-one. -on -one. All right, anybody else? Joy and Neil, are, are you able to hear? Uh, Neil's here. Okay, Neil. Joy's got a mission board meeting tonight. Okay, thank you, yeah. All right, well, um, thank you guys for, for sharing from your reading. Uh, this week. Um, I will uh, go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started with the PowerPoint. Um, let's see here. I did want to start with uh, this part first, which is just a review again of starting because we're moving tonight into the last letter of the book uh, or of the letter of the word stages. So we've reached the last S um the it'll be tonight and then tomorrow or next monday and we'll be finished with the first 13 weeks of uh the uh, the grow class um and at the end i'll, I'll talk about kind of where we want to go after we finish that up next monday night so we started out with the first s of stages which was starting so it started in a fertile crescent but god scattered them throughout the world and so we remember S is for starting, creation, fall, flood, Babel, Genesis 1 through 11. Um, the next is then Abraham and his descendants went to Canaan and eventually to Egypt, which was the T for treaties and tribes. And we looked at Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And remembering that that first uh, chapters 1 through 11 covered uh, about 2,000 years. Uh, the T in the Treaties and Tribes covers about 600 years for those first generations. Um, the, four, or the third, the A, is advancement. So after 400 years of slavery, they were led by Moses and Joshua into the Promised Land. <clears throat> so exiting, they exited Egypt. They wandered around 
the desert. They conquered the promised land and then they were um, ruled by judges for the first 400 years here of the, uh, the time that they were in the promised land. So that's the A, advancement. Then we go on to the G, glory. They had only 120 years of great glory under three kings. And so this is the period that today's Israelites still reflect upon. Um, the three kings were, of course, Saul, David, and Solomon. That was the G of stages, glory. Only covered about 120 years. Um, each one of these three men ruled 40 years. And where we were last week was this part. Israel lasted for several hundred years, but fell away from God. So they were sent into slavery in Babylon. Uh, so that's the E of stages or erosion. Uh, they divided up. We remember last week from uh, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, um, made a very poor choice by following the counsel of the young men instead of the older men. And it led to a division of Israel, north and the south. After that point, the north was called Israel, the south was called Judah. And then they were dispersed um, and then they were deported. And that's where we ended last week in 586 BC, where the Babylonians had come into uh, the land of Israel, into Judah, and had destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, had pretty much leveled the city of Jerusalem, and had carried off um, people into captivity. So <clears throat> where we're headed tonight is the last S. After 70 years, God brought them home, and they waited... 400 years until Christ was born. So after we finish this um, uh, this uh, study in the next couple weeks, we're coming up to the time of Jesus Christ. So this period is called servitude, and it may be, and, and we will study about tonight, that they do come back to the promised land. Um, they are allowed to come back and allowed to rebuild Jerusalem, the temple, uh, the, the walls, um, but they are not allowed to actually establish their own nation. They're still serving other nations and they will um, all the way through the time of Jesus Christ. As you, know, as you read in the gospels, um, the, the land of Israel, uh, they're not governing themselves. Uh, they have Roman soldiers throughout. Um, and so they are, uh, they're occupied by the Romans. So in this time that we're looking at tonight, in the last S of servitude for the Old Testament, um, they are still under the influence of the Persians when this all finishes up. So we'll move on to, um, let me go to this part. All right. Can everybody see that? Lesson 12, yeah. servitude. All right. So we're going to talk about the Babylonian captivity tonight. Um, how long does the uh, period of servitude last? Um, is 70 years is correct. And it was prophesied that this uh, would last 70 years. So they would be carried away to Babylon. But God would move quickly, I guess in God's timing, pretty quickly, 70 years, and then they would be starting to come back. So the period of the Babylonian slavery lasted 70 years. But the entire period of servitude lasted from 586 BC all the way till May 1948, just um, you know about 70 years ago when Israel finally became a nation. Um, some of you uh, may even have been born at the time when, when Israel was not a nation yet. Um, they were, it was called Palestine before it became the land of Israel and it, it was uh, Kind of monitored or uh, ruled by the British uh, before Israel actually became a nation uh, in 1948. So all the way from the time we're talking about tonight until just 70 years ago from today, um, Israel, this land, the Jews, uh, were serving other um, people who had taken over the land. And people came through, Muslims, uh, the British, and we're talking about right now the, the Babylonians and then the Persians. Um, why 70 years? Um, and this is talked about, this is really like the last uh, verses of Second Chronicles where we lead up to the time of Ezra. Second Chronicles 36, 20 
says, <clears throat> he carried into exile to, to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rest all the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Jeremiah 25, 11 says, this whole country will become a desolate wasteland and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. So Jeremiah was around at the time uh, of 586 when the Babylonians came into and destroyed Jerusalem. And his prophecy at, the, was, at that time is that this servitude or, or this Babylonian captivity was going to last 70 years. So that's how long uh, the servitude period lasts. Um, but Jeremiah 25, 12 says, but when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation and the land of the Babylonians for their guilt, declares the Lord, and will make it desolate forever. So interesting, again, just like we saw with Egypt, where uh, God used a foreign king, Pharaoh, uh, in his purposes. Here he is using um, foreign kings for his purposes with his people. He uses the king of Babylon to bring judgment to the people of Israel. And then we'll see that he uses the king of Persia to actually bless uh, the people of Israel to allow them to come back. Uh, Daniel 9.2 is another scripture um, where Daniel is one of the exiles. He is one of the people who is actually taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. And uh, if you've read, and we'll read Daniel in the next section uh, when we're studying the prophets. So he was one of the, um, uh, the sons of the nobles and the people in Jerusalem when the Babylonians came in and took over. And he was carried off into exile and he worked for the Babylonian kings. And so he's in prayer at some point, And he says, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So at the time of Daniel, just a few years after Jeremiah had prophesied, Daniel recognizes that Je what Jeremiah prophesied was scripture, that it was the word of God, and it was written down, and Daniel must have either taken or had a copy of the book of Jeremiah or the prophecies of Jeremiah with him. And so he's studying this when he's in Babylon, in captivity, and he realizes uh, that Jeremiah has prophesied that this time would last 70 years. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and we kind of talked about this before, about why 70 years. So God asked the Israelites to let the land rest one year for every seven years, and they failed to do that. So in Leviticus 25, one through seven, uh, if you get a chance to read that later, it talks about how the Israelites were supposed to farm for six years, and then on that seventh year, they weren't supposed to farm. They weren't supposed to plant anything. The farmers were supposed to take a year off and just let the land go, let it go fallow, let the weeds grow, let whatever's going to grow, grow, and leave it alone for a year. And then come back after that uh, year of Sabbath and till up the land again and start over for another year. But the Israelites didn't do that. Um, they kept on farming the land and kept, you know, taking the produce from that land in those sab sabbatical years where they were supposed to not do that. So, uh, one of the reasons for the fact that this servitude time was 70 years is they were in the land about 490 years. So if you divide that by seven, they pretty much had 70 sabbatical years that they were not obedient to God. So God said, okay, I'm going to force the land to rest. And I, I thought about this just as an application for us. You know, we're, we're not under the law anymore. We're not under the, um, <clears throat> you know, under the dictate that we must follow the Sabbath. We've been kind of released from that. But 
we're still human beings that need rest and need a Sabbath rest. So if we don't take a Sabbath rest for ourselves and, and use that time to, to focus upon God, it's possible that God may force us to rest <laughs> by, let's say, having a surgery, uh, let's say, having health problems where we can't do the work that we want to be able to do. So I thought of an application for us to say, we need to make sure that we are resting the way God wants us to rest, or we may be forced to rest like the Israelites were forced to rest. And I put that in quotations because they were taken off into slavery, but he forced the land to rest for 70 years. So next, the, the reasons for the captivity. Um, the reasons why they went into captivity, and that's one of them, like I just said, they didn't allow the land to rest. But another reason was just the way that they behaved themselves and the way they lived. The, the reason for captivity boils down to two major types of sin, idolatry and sexual sin. And really, it's the idolatry that leads to the sexual sin. Um, instead of following after God and uh, doing what God and following his rules and commandments and um, allowing God to be God and not taking these idols as their God, um, they introduced the sexual sin in there because as part of worshiping maybe ba Baal or Ashtaroth or some of these other false gods, part of that was um, being involved in sexual sin as part of their religion. Um, so, and they also intermarried. <clears throat> uh, the Lord said to Moses, uh, oh, and this is the scripture that I had referred to. The Lord said to Moses on Mount Sinai, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land, I'm giving, going to give you the land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years, sow your fields, and for six years, prune your vineyards and gather their crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. Do not sow or reap your fields or prune your vineyards. Do not reap what grows itself or harvest the grapes of your untended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. Whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year will be food for you, for yourself, for your manservant, maidservant, hired worker, and temporary resident who lives among you, as well as for your livestock. Whatever the land produces may be eaten. Uh, so that was what God had said. He said, just let it land lie fallow. Um, I think in some ways last year, because of the rain, some of the land around here was uh, lied fallow. They couldn't actually plant it because it was so wet for so long. I think they got most of it all planted this year, um, but they did not follow this, and that's why they went into captivity. All right, so the captives have been taken in three waves, and this is on, let's see, page 74. So the first wave was in 605 BC, and so actually that is before um, even the Babylonians had come in and destroyed uh, Jerusalem, that's 586. So almost 20 years before, the Babylonians had taken over part of the land and were taking away people. Uh, Daniel, the royalty, and the princes, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they were part of this first wave uh, of captives that were taken from Israel to Babylon. And if you remember the story of Daniel, uh, these uh, young men were taken to serve in the court of Nebuchadnezzar uh, in Babylon. So only actually about 74 um, was the number of people taken captive in this first wave very early on. And the second one was in 597. So that was Ezekiel, the, the prophet Ezekiel was taken captive. Uh, the common people, particularly those able to work and stand the trip, so some of the younger people were taken. A lot of the older people uh, were left in uh, Israel because they uh, didn't serve uh, a real purpose for the Babylonians. They wouldn't be able to work. And uh, it was a tough trip from Israel to Babylon. So um, they may not have even been able to make the trip. Uh, if you've heard of the um, <clears throat> Bataan Death March, that's made makes me think of the Bataan Death March from World War II um, and that the difficult 
uh, I'm sure that the Babylonians were not treating these people well as they forced them to walk to the east all the way over to Babylon. And if you think about it today and look on a map, it's, it's going from Jerusalem all the way over into Iraq. So it's walking across what would be like Syria and Lebanon um, and um, Jordan today and walking, making that walk all the way across there. About 30,000 people were taken into exile in 597 BC. So uh, we have a, a bigger group that was taken. The third one, the final wave, um, more common people were taken and that's at the destruction of Jerusalem in 586. So three waves of people were taken away and off into Babylon. So all these people who had part of maybe seen um, some of the glory of God, the temple in Judah and in Jerusalem were, were taken off into slavery. Again, because of their sin, idolatry, sexual sin. And that's the one thing um, that I can point out here is that after this particular time period, the Jewish people never have a struggle with idolatry again. This particular um, experience for the Jewish people Get going into captivity and having to serve Babylon and the Assyrians and then eventually the Persians, um, it cured them of the desire for I idols and idolatry. And from that point on, um, they serve the one God and still do uh, today. So now they're off into um, captivity, uh, but then it's uh, very quickly they will begin to return. So we read in the scriptures that when Cyrus conquered the Babylonian empire, he did not want the Israelite people to remain. So he allowed them to return to their homeland. So Babylon was um, taken over by the Persian empire. So Babylon kind of resides in present day Iraq and the Persian empire resides in present day Iran. So they had an Iraq-Iran war back in these days, just like they did uh, back in the 19, I think it was the 1980s and 90s, where Iraq and Iran were at war with each other. Uh, so Iran defeated Iraq, or the Persians defeated the Babylonians, and the leader of the uh, Persians decided to send the Israelite people back home. And this edict happened on May 14th of 445 BC, uh, when Cyrus gave the command to send the people back. So that May 14th, very interesting day, May 14th, 1948, was the date that uh, Israel became a nation again. So May 14th, a special day for the Israelites. So they're gonna come back in three different waves. Um, they're gonna come back between 537 and 515 with a leader named Zerubbabel. His purpose was to rebuild God's temple. And they worked for 16 years with him leading them, but they did not finish the temple. And in fact, they became discouraged. And you might remember this from reading the book of Ezra this week, uh, that there were all of these um, other uh, nations and uh, people groups around Jerusalem that were giving the J returning Jews a hard time about building God's temple. And in fact, as the kings uh, in Babylon turned over, uh, they would write letters back to the new king and say, hey, you're letting these Jews rebuild Jerusalem. And hey, if you remember, this, uh, these Jews and Jerusalem are always causing trouble. So hey, new king of Babylon, stop these people from rebuilding. And that happened in the, in the book of Ezra. So at some point, the people became discouraged and they pretty much stopped the rebuilding of the temple. So it took them eventually about 20 years to, to rebuild. There were a couple of the prophets that we will study later, Haggai and Zechari or Zechariah, who helped to build the people back up to finish the temple. So they eventually do. Um, but it, it made me think of, uh, you know, kind of an application. Um, are there times where you start projects 
and you get discouraged and you don't finish them. <laughs> so I, I can think of projects that I've started that I need to finish it someday. Um, but I, at, you know, over time you get discouraged and you need a prophet. You need the, the word of God to help give you the motivation to, to finish that project. If it's something good that God has, you know, called you to do, um, to live maybe uh, more healthy or get something done or study the scripture more, uh, just various ways that we fall short sometimes in the things that God calls us to do. So we're going to talk about, and just Zerubbabel this week, um, next week and then the following week, we'll hit these other two waves that people come back. So the second wave of people that come back to Jerusalem from the Babylon, Babylon uh, was led by uh, actually the writer of the book of Ezra, Ezra himself, uh, the one that Pastor Rick talked about, the one that had de whoops, devoted himself to the scriptures, Ezra. Uh, he was a cheerleader who encouraged both the first group and the group with him to get back to work. With the help of Ezra and the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the temple was finally rebuilt and dedicated. And um, you'll, you'll notice that the, um, they celebrated the Passover as soon as they had finished that temple. Um, so it was finally completed. But if you look at the dates, let me go back up here to the Zerubbabel. Uh, his time period ended in 515. And the time of Ezra started in 458. So 42 plus 15. So we've got about 62 years here of uh, time period so time for people to get discouraged and say when is this ever going to be finished i started this work and and uh, we've started rebuilding and and we haven't gotten it done yet so they finally finished the temple with the second wave of people coming back with ezra um, and then the third wave comes back with uh, nehemiah and we'll be reading nehemiah for this coming week uh, that'll be your reading assignment, is to read the book of Nehemiah. So he comes about 14 years after Ezra. This is the third wave of people coming back from Babylon and Persia. So he had a passion to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And the walls are rebuilt in 52 days under Nehemiah's leadership. And more important than the walls, a great revival took place because of this accomplishment. So Considering this, I'm sure walls are easier to build than the temple, but it takes them years and years and years to finish rebuilding the temple. Where when Nehemiah gets back, uh, and as we study this, it's amazing uh, how great of a leader Nehemiah was. And he got everybody in Jerusalem to help rebuild these walls. And, and each family took upon themselves the responsibility to build the section of the wall right where they lived and so with everybody helping everybody kicking in they were able to get the walls of jerusalem rebuilt in just 52 days so those were the three waves of people coming back to uh, jerusalem and that's kind of an overview of all of this section of servitude like i said we're just going to hit zerubbabel to tonight and next week we'll finish up Ezra and uh, Nehemiah. So the decree to go home came from, and this starts the book of Ezra. Ezra uh, chapter one, verse two says, this is what Cyrus king of Persia says, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem and Judah. Any one of his people among you May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem oops, in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And th this is a Persian king saying this. <laughs> He's saying, all right, you Jewish people, go back to Jerusalem and rebuild. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold and with goods and livestock and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Um, so Cyrus here, the king of Persia, gives the uh, command, the decree, hey, all you Jews, go home, go rebuild. I'm giving you the right to go back and I'm also gonna provide you with 
all of the silver and gold and goods and livestock and anything that you need to rebuild that temple, I will provide it. So the amazing thing about this is that there was a prophecy in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 44, 21 through 28, and Isaiah 45, verses 1 through 5, that actually names the name of Cyrus a hundred years before he is born. So Isaiah prophesies, and it, as we will look at Isaiah, Isaiah was a prophet during the time of Hezekiah, the king of um, uh, Judah. So many, many years before Cyrus was even born. And so in Isaiah chapter 40, and 45. This prophecy was written by Isaiah more than 100 years before King Cyrus was even born. Isaiah prophesied during the period of erosion. So we are told that although the Israelites were allowed to go home, well, let me go back to this real quick. I, um, I would just advise you, or if you get a chance to read this, but in two places, Isaiah names the name Cyrus and says that Cyrus is going to be the one that sends the people back to Jerusalem. So 100 years before Cyrus is born and about 150 years before the actual decree is given. So God knew it was going to be Cyrus before Cyrus was even born. So the, the decree is given um, and the Israelites were allowed to go home, but only 50,000 Jews actually go home to Israel. Um, from uh, Pastor Miller, um, and just listening to him, uh, their estimate is that about 500,000 Jews were in uh, the area of Babylon and Persia who could have gone home back to Jerusalem, back to Israel, but only 50,000 went. So only about 10% of those who could go home actually went home. And why does this seem strange to you? Why did they not go home? It's because after a period of about 70 years, many of them had become very comfortable. Uh, they had built homes in uh, Babylon, these Jewish people. Uh, they had started businesses in Babylon and in Persia. And they'd intermarried with the Babylonians. So many of them did not have a desire to go back to a homeland that they didn't even remember. Um, I mean, if they were younger than 70 years old, they were born in Babylon. So Babylon to them was their home. So they didn't go back and really had no desire to return. I, I thought of this as, you know, uh, there's always reasons why people don't come to Christ and it's not always because they um, don't believe. Sometimes it's other reasons why they won't give their heart and life to Christ. Sometimes it's because um, of a business maybe that they're in. They don't want to give time to God. They know it's going to require time. Um, maybe they think they're going to have to give up possessions. Maybe they're married to someone who's not a Christian. Um, it's kind of an interesting parallel here, why people didn't come back. All right, so not everybody goes home, and there's a punishment for not returning home. So the decision of most to remain in Babylon certainly did not please God, and he had provided an opportunity for them to go to their homeland. He had risen up a foreign king who was willing to pay for them to go home and willing to give them the money they needed to rebuild the temple, to give them the money they needed to, to build a home, to live in that land, but many of them did not go home. And so Ezekiel actually prophesied, this prophet Ezekiel who was taken into captivity, he prophesied and said, then lie on your left side and put the sin of the house of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for a number of days, you lie on your side. I have assigned you the same number of days as years of their sin. So for 390 days, you will bear the sin of the house of Israel. So he, God tells Ezekiel, 
I want you to lie on your left side for 390 days. And it's a sign for this extra bit of uh, servitude that the people are going to have to do. And then after you finish this, lie down again, this time on your right side, and bear the sin of the house of Judah. I have assigned to you 40 days a day for each year. Turn your face toward the siege of Jerusalem and with bared arm prophesy against her. I will tie you up with ropes so that you cannot turn from one side to the other until you have finished the days of your siege. And uh, Pastor Miller goes through a kind of a mathematical um, way of showing that these 390 days stand for 390 years and 40 days stands for 40 years. And if you add that together, 430 years. I'm not going to go through all that math, but he makes it so where that is the reason why Israel had to serve other nations all the way up to 1948. So um, I didn't agree totally with the math, so I'm not going to share it with you. But definitely God was not pleased that the Jews did not return to the promised land, that they were still tied to the land of Babylon. And, and we see that, um, you know, all the way up into 1948 is that the Jewish people uh, are scattered all over the world. You know, many in Eastern Europe and Germany, um, and they faced, uh, you know, persecution there. Uh, and they were just scattered all over the place and not in the land that God had given them. So from this point on, uh, the Israelites are called Jews, and Jews is just a, a shortened term for, uh, it comes from the term Judah, and it's now the preferred name of the Israelite people. However, Israelite is preferred um, because of the connotation of the suffering of the Jews over the past generation uh, generations. So uh, Jew is a proper term, or Israelite also is a proper term for the Jewish people now. Uh, so let's get that. So Cyrus helped the Jews in their return. He provided the resources and gives them free passage, just as the prophecies had suggested. We kind of talked about that before. Um, Again, only about 10% came home. So in Ezra 1 through 6 and Zechariah and Haggai, we read the following. The first thing to be rebuilt was the temple. And this is the fill in the fill of the blanks there at the bottom of page 75 of the notes. Uh, first thing is rebuilt was the temple. The people became discouraged under opposition. Two prophets encouraged and motivated the people. And in 20 years, then the temple was completed. So first thing to rebuild was the temple. People were discouraged at first. The prophets helped them and, and gave them the courage to, to finish it. So in 20 years, the temple was completed. Now, you also read uh, for this week, and we're, we're almost finished, is the book of Esther. And it's interesting to see where uh, the book of Esther fits in to this period. It really is right at the same point of time as Zerubbabel. And so you're probably thinking, well, if I look at the way the, the Bible is set up, um, you know, you've got the book, after Chronicles, you've got the book of Ezra, and then you've got Nehemiah, and then Esther is really the last book of history. So it's not actually in chronological order. Uh, the book of Esther if we put it in the right historical context, is in the time of that Zerubbabel, or the first group of people coming back to Jerusalem. So uh, a slave girl was named Queen, and if you read the story, uh, the king, the Persian king named Xerxes, uh, was not happy with his present king, so he had a beauty contest, and this Jewish girl named Esther, who was the cousin of a man named Mordecai, um, won the beauty contest and became the queen uh, of Persia. Now, at that time, though, um, there was another man named Haman who had this idea, and for some reason he was upset with the Jewish people, mainly because of uh, Mordecai uh, would not bow down to him. And so 
he kind of snuck into the king uh, without Esther's knowledge and said, you know, king, these Jewish people, they're causing you problems. And the king wasn't even aware at that time that his queen Esther was a Jew. And so Haman had this idea that we're going to have this one day uh, and a, everybody's going to persecute and kill off as many Jews as possible. And so he talks the, the king into issuing this edict that this is going to happen. And so if this does not get taken back, many of the Jews are going to be killed and, and destroyed. And so Esther walks in when she really wasn't supposed to into the king and with uh, courage asks uh, the king for a favor. And if you read it, it's really a, a beautiful story. It's that, um, you know, Esther uh, gets the attention of the king and Haman uh, does not get to go through with his plan. And in fact, the Jewish people are, um, you know, put forward and blessed instead of being cursed. Um, and so one of the conjectures of who Esther might be is that Esther could have been the mother of Cyrus, the man, the king who actually sent the Jews back home. So was Cyrus half Jewish? Um, question mark here because we don't know from scripture, but it's, um, and if you look up Esther and, and try to look at commentaries, uh, different um, Bible scholars have different thoughts as to where Esther fits in. Um, and they say, well, probably she wasn't um, a Babylonian queen because the Babylonians would not have taken a Jewish person uh, as their queen. Uh, so more than likely, it was a Persian king. So I'm going to leave that for Bible scholars to debate. It's just a wonderful story, Esther, of um, someone who, uh, through prayer and fasting, um, uh, does something very courageous. So if you haven't read that, I encourage you to read that. So re that's really uh, what we have tonight. Um, any questions or comments on Zerubbabel and Esther? Uh, as I said, next week we'll talk about um, Ezra and what he does when he gets back to Jerusalem and then Nehemiah building the walls. So any questions or comments for tonight? Um, my plan is to finish up uh, next week will be part 13 of this uh, part one of the people. The second part deals with the Psalms and Proverbs and all of the uh, prophets, Isaiah, all the way through Malachi. And, you know, we went through these uh, section of the Kings, the erosion part really quickly last week. Um, and so most of the prophets actually fit into that time of erosion. So we will, we will come back to that time of all the different Kings of the Northern and Southern kingdoms during that time. But, my thought is we'll finish up next week uh, with part 13. Take um, August off, give everybody a break, and then come back the Monday after Labor Day. So that'd be September 14th, and we'll start uh, part two of the GROW class. So that is my plan, unless um, anybody have any comments or suggestions on that. All right, well, thank you very much for uh, joining the class tonight. And um, like I said, it, it is, if it went a little bit too quick, it will be recorded and on the YouTube. But again, we will finish up next Monday night with part 13 and we'll be done with the history of the Old Testament. So thanks everybody for joining tonight. Have a thanks, great day. Thanks, David. Good day. David. Thank thanks, you. David. Good day. Yep. Thank you. Have a good, good night. Evening.